So, nuclear power, risky, certainly. There are long-term issues regarding the storage of waste that cannot, be, that cannot be ignored. But when you compare it with the other things that we're doing, it pales into insignificance. You've got to know what you're doing. That's, that's the main thing. You've got to know what you're doing. You can't have amateur crews. You can't cut costs. I would go so far to say is that if anyone is running nuclear power, no, that it should not be a commercial company. There should be no profit motive whatsoever. It should be done by the government. And it should be done according to the strictest standards. And there is an example for that kind of thing. There is, there is a large set of data. The biggest operator of nuclear reactors in the world, by far, is the United States Navy. Their submarines, their aircraft carriers, some of their larger sur sur surface competent warships are nuclear powered. They have never had an accident, they have never had a meltdown, even a partial one. They've never had an issue with processing or uh, reprocessing fuel or handling fuel. And the reason is threefold. First of all, they take the very best people they can find. And in the Navy, they have extremely good people. And they're selected to the highest standards, they're trained to the highest standards, and there is zero tolerance for any kind of messing around. You, you read a newspaper in, in the reactor control compartment of a submarine, you're out. You have a moment of inattention, you don't pass your tests, you're up. And that's the way it should be. When you're handling that kind of technology with the potential for, for danger and, and destruction that it holds. But these people have been, have been running reactors for 55 years. Hundreds of reactors. They, they have tens of thousands of reactor hours. The number of reactors multiplied by the number of, of uh, sorry, reactor years, by the number of years they've been operating. And they've never had a casualty. So it certainly is possible to do it, but you really have to know what you're doing and you can't be compromising. Fukushima. Fukushima is basically a 1960s time accident. It's using 1960s technology. There's Fukushima right there. Six boiling water reactors. These two, by the way, were in cold storage. They were in cold shutdown. They were being maintained and upgraded, but they weren't running. They didn't even have any fuel rods inside. They didn't have any spent fuel pools like the other ones did. These were the ones that were partially up. I think four was down, but it had spent fuel in the pools. Spent fuel pools are where they put the rods. Rods are easily poisoned, okay? You put your fuel rods in. They don't, get, they don't use up all the uranium, but what happens is they accumulate various poisons, like xenon, that are produced in the reaction, and they, they absorb neutrons, and so they have to be taken out and essentially cleaned and reprocessed and then put back in again. When they're taken out first, they're very hot, and the decay heat has to be allowed to diminish. So for a couple of months, or perhaps even a couple of years, they put into these pools, like big swimming pools. And they're kept under water for cooling and to make sure that none of the radiation escapes into the air. And that's a sort of a normal thing. So it isn't normal, as they did in Fukushima, to put the pools right on top of the damned reactors. They should be further away. They should be such that if anything happens to the reactors, it doesn't take out the spent fuel pool as well. Because there's at least as much fuel in here as there is in there. And unlike the stuff in there, this is not inside a pressure vessel. Okay? This is something that you need to really work very hard to breach. They're designed to stand huge overpressures. And certainly, you know, you, you, there's almost nothing that I can think of that would breach this sort of container unless you really, you know, went at it with, with deliberate intent for a very long time. But these things are not kept there. And this fuel, if, it, if the water level drops or if it goes out in the air, the decay heat will cause it to melt and possibly cause it to go on fire. And then you'll get release of some of this material into the air and into the environment. And that's not good. Now, it's not like a nuclear explosion. It's not like Chernobyl where all this stuff goes into the air. But it's certainly going to pollute the environment. And that's something to be avoided. But it's not that they shouldn't be in, in that locality. But nonetheless, what happened here is that they lost their coolant they lost their coolant, but they only had one set of pumps. They had a backup power supply in the form of diesel generators, and then they had a battery supply, but the batteries only lasted for eight hours, which is really inconsequential. It doesn't matter and what happened there. I think I suspect they had them there just to say that they had them there, but they had a second there of redundancy, but in reality they didn't. They should have had a second set of diesel generators remotely located from the first, ready to kick in at a moment's notice. They did not. Now, in fairness to them, they had a 9.0 earthquake, which took out the primary systems. The reactor continued to be on damage. It scrammed immediately, the earthquake hit, because there were seismic sensors and these things, and the control rods just dropped in and shut it down. 
But as I said, the excess heat, the decay heat that kept on bubbling away, the diesel kicked in, as they were designed to do. Then the tsunami came along, but they were designed to withstand, I think, a 7 meter tsunami. They got a 15 meter tsunami. And this was a, an event that should statistically not have happened, but it did. That wiped out the diesel generators. They didn't have a second set. They should have had a second set. Why didn't they have a second set? It would have cost them at most a million, a million euros, a million dollars, to produce the kind of power and flow rate that they needed to have. And drop them the buckets. They didn't have them. They had these batteries. Go to batteries. We need to keep the decay heat quiet for weeks, if not months. We don't have a battery, it's like a joke. And that's what they had. So Fukushima was, was bad design in a sense. The reactor did what it was supposed to do. The auxiliary stuff, the cooling pumps, they were hugely inferior to the task that they had to produce, that they had to, the task they had to perform. So they ended up spewing out water and some of this stuff, certainly some iodine, some cesium, maybe some strontium. It's all within 30 kilometers of the zone, or at least it was initially. They then started to suffer from hydrogen explosions because if you're not controlling the temperature, the steam begins to build up. Steam reacts with the zircaloy cladding on the fuel rods and it gives you zirconium oxide and hydrogen. And hydrogen, one of the reasons we don't drive our cars powered by hydrogen, even though everybody keeps asking for it, is that it's extremely dangerous. It's such a tiny molecule and it gets out from anything. You can't seal it in. Just, it always finds a way of diffusing through whatever barrier you put up. And then it explodes. And one of the explosions, three of the explosions that happened did not breach the containment vessel that I put up there, which is a testament to the strength of that design. The fourth one, however, did so. And that resulted in a leaking of material out into the ground, out through into the water. The other three were fine. One of the reactors is still leaking. It's leaking relatively slowly. And it probably they will be able to stem the leak eventually because the temperature is coming down and the pressure is coming down all the time. So the force that's pushing the leak is diminishing. But it's still leaking. And that shouldn't have happened. Um, but really, it shouldn't have happened because they should never have allowed the pressure to build up enough. They should never have built up. The temperature should not have built up to the point where the hydrogen was generated. But that's one of the hazards if they're not... And it's all about temperature control. This is just a scaled-up version of what you have in your central heating system at home. This is not rocket science. This is not cutting-edge technology. It's pumps and pipes. It should not have happened. There are systems... I'm showing you a picture of one of them. It's in Italian, but basically it's a pebble head reactor. Instead of having all these rods and coolants circulating around by, by pumping, these things are basically like a tennis ball-sized piece of material. And inside each tennis ball is a whole lot of little pellets. And these pellets are uranium, covered by graphite, so the graphite is the moderator, and then covered by something really hard and fireproof like silicon carbide. And these things, they, they come into this reactor, because of their size, they have a certain proximity to each other. That starts the reaction. Temperature goes up, it starts to... They're actually temperature sensitive. If the temperature goes up too high, it stops immediately. So that's the first thing. It can't go critical. You don't need a moderator because each pellet has its own little bit of graphite moderator. The graphite can't go on fire because it's covered by silicon carbide. At least it better not go on fire. And the thing is cooled by gas. You take an inert gas like helium or krypton or xenon, and you force cool it, and this whole thing can run it 1,500, 2,000 degrees Celsius, whatever the containment vessel can support. There's no coolant, there's no pumps. This thing is passively cooled. So it can't run away permanently. The neutron management is arranged simply by the fact that these things can't get closer to each other than a certain, basically by the diameter of the sphere. And there... They started working on these things in the 60s, but then at that time they didn't have the technology to make these things properly. And so the industry abandoned it in favor of the current sort of uranium rod technology. But recently, because the rod technology is limited, because it has these safety issues, these things are coming back into force again. Now, the U.S. isn't doing much of it. They used to do it at Oak Ridge Lab, which is in Tennessee, which is where they process a lot of their fuels. But they've stopped. Nowadays, most of the, re most of the work on pedal beds is being done in China, in South Africa. It's a little bit done in the Netherlands. The French, of course, are very much to the fore in nuclear technology because they generate 80% of their electricity using it. So they're very interested in this technology. There's a little bit of work going on in the UK. This actually is an opportunity. This type of technology, because it's totally new, it's much smaller in scale. It's inherently safe. Huge value added. Whoever gets the patents for these will make huge amounts of money. 
This is something that Ireland could easily become involved in if there were. But you know, Ireland, look, we're, we're talking about tourism and food, but you know, that's only going to get us so far. We need a new industry, we need a new, a new strength, we need something to do with food, as well as to conquer the world again. Now, this sort of thing, why not? You have to set your sights reasonably high. But the old nuclear technology is still, there's still a lot of it out there. There's hundreds and hundreds of power stations installed. Another type of technology which is very interesting, I won't get into the ducks and bolts of it, but instead of using, this is a bit more like the, the pressurized water or boiling water system, but this uses salts of uranium or thorium. Much higher temperatures, like molten metals. The Russians, who did all the most risky things you can imagine, they used to put liquid sodium reactors in their submarines. Now, sodium is a very reactive metal. When you liquefy it at high temperature, it becomes even more reactive. And God forbid if it ever gets out of the reactor in salt water, because then, you know, the reaction just goes crazy. So it's the worst possible thing you could put in a, in a reactor in a submarine. But they did it, because <laughs> they wanted more power. They wanted to beat the Americans, so they wanted more power. And they were building submarines at the time, which were called Victors, and then they were building Aculas, and then they were building, I think, the, um, what do they call it? I can't remember now, but one of their fastest submarines used this, this sodium, molten sodium reactor technology, which killed half the people who worked in the submarine, but, you know, in the Soviet Union, they didn't care too much about that. Um, the, the American submarines, by the way, they all use pressurized water or boiling water systems, so they're all very safe. But this stuff, this stuff allows you to use thorium. Uranium is limited. You have to enrich it. It's not that abundant. Um, it has all kinds of problems, and it turns into plutonium, and it turns into plutonium, even though someone might have a civilian nuclear reactor, suddenly they can turn around and build a bomb. Whereas normally you can tell if they're going to build a bomb because they have these enormous enrichment, enrichment plants like the Iranians have now. I mean, a bomb requires enriched uranium or plutonium. There's no other way. Uh, a civilian reactor can run quite happily on natural uranium or on different isotopes of uranium or thorium or anything like that. But if you, have, if you start with uranium, you can end up with plutonium. So if someone buys a civilian nuclear reactor or builds one, and they start off with uranium, it's only a matter of time before they end up with enough plutonium to build a bomb. And that's not good, especially, you know, if it's Iran or North Korea or some of the people that we don't really trust. But if you start with one of these things, you can start with thorium, then you can't end up with plutonium. You end up with uranium-233. Uranium-233 does not give you plutonium. Uranium-235 gives you plutonium. So much safer. No proliferation risks. The waste that comes out of these things decays in 100 years instead of 10,000 years. So the problems of storing it become much more tractable. You're no longer leaving it to your, you know, 10 generations hence. You, at most you have to, you know, look after it for 100 years. But most things are seism seismically stable for 100 years. So you can figure out ways and places to store the waste. Lots and lots of advantages. Now this is not something that we could do here in Ireland because this is major engineering and this is something for which you need an established industry. But this is what the Americans should be working on. But of course they're not, because the world's nuclear power has become so toxic over there. Again, the Chinese are doing it. But the Germans are doing some of it. The French are doing it. And this is probably going to be the future of nuclear reactors, because the pedal bed stuff is a bit too innovative. But if we worked on pedal beds and made them, made them hot and made them trustworthy, I'd, I'd be willing to bet that we could make a difference. Anyway, I'm, I, I'm not a an advocate of nuclear power, but neither am I a, a denier. The cost of burning fossil fuels will pretty soon become too high to pay, either the financial cost or the environmental cost. Now, it doesn't matter whether they're biofuels or, or dug out of the ground. The, the same environment, environmental damage will result. The same health costs of breeding the particulate matter will result. And so we're going to have to change the way we think about power generation and use. Obviously, the best thing to do is if you can reduce demand, if you can, you can pay people to stop using power. It sounds like a silly thing to do, because up to now, the power companies, have, you know, we want to pay you to take our power. Well, if you consider the cost of generating power, a fossil fuel plant will generate power at something like the capital cost of the thing, not the running costs. Maybe $2,000 a kilowatt, approximately. Maybe 1500 if you really if you're really economical, but 2,000 a kilowatt is, is pretty much normal. Right now, the cost of a safe nuclear power system with, with all the current safeguards is closer to 10,000. That's full life cycle cost, includes the cost of decommissioning, storing the waste, etc. But it's about five times as high. So my objection to nuclear power is not so much on safety grounds, although you have to address them, 
is the fact that it's so expensive. Because you have to invest in these safety technologies, otherwise don't do it. Like I said, it's your nuclear materials, those are your gamma rays, your alpha particles, don't be spending them. If you produce them, you've got to safeguard them. And that costs a lot of money. So that would be my primary objective to nuclear power. But nonetheless, I mean, you have to keep the lights on. So you can pay people up to $10,000 a kilowatt to, to require less power, and you're ahead of the game. You're spending less than you would to build a power station to satisfy their demands. Um, having said that, there will be demands, there will be industry, there will be lights at home, there will be things that we want to do. We might even want to entertain ourselves from time to time. And roughly speaking, Ireland has a budget of about 5 gigawatts, 5,000 megawatts. You need that much capacity to give people a decent standard of living and maintain the sort of transport and, and industry that we have. And so we have to figure out how we're going to generate that when we're not allowed to burn fossil fuels anymore. You can have a windmill in every street corner, you'd never get there. But windmills are notoriously inefficient. Even if you specify them as a kilowatt, then you'd be lucky if you get 100 watts out of them, just because of the way turbines work. Uh, wave power, likewise, you know, you, it's very hard to extract meaningful power from them. I'm not saying you don't do it. I mean, do all these things, do everything you can. Put solar panels on top of everything, conserve wherever you can. But you're always left with a couple of gigawatts, a couple of thousand megawatts that you have to generate. If you can't burn fossil fuels, you've got to do something like this. Otherwise, we're all in trouble. And the trouble is really, it takes 20 years to build something like that. So if you're not deciding to do it now, by the time the 20 years are up and the lights are off, Everybody's pointing fingers at each other, saying, you should have done this, sir, you should have told us that, no, you shouldn't. What's the point? You're out of the game. You're back in the Stone Age. You're, you're back to prioritizing the hospitals and, the, and the, the police or whatever. You know, only they've got power, and then the rest of us are wrapping ourselves up in God knows what. It's just another good image. And when you see something coming, you know it's going to happen in 20 years, and people are just BSing about other things all the time, really annoys. Really noisy. Anyway, that's a separate discussion. That's a, that's a completely different thing to talk about. Radiation is bad. It is bad for you, and if you get too much of it, it will kill you. Uh, the same is true of most things in life. It is not a man-made problem. It is mostly a natural problem. But if you want to generate power using any of these technologies, it becomes a man-made problem in the sense that you're producing more, and it's your responsibility to manage it. Um, there have been some spectacular failures of responsibility to manage it, most notably Chernobyl. Uh, Chernobyl, as I've pointed out in many different ways, was an abomination. Three Mile Island was a tiny squib, but it had the result of scaring an entire nation, the most powerful nation on the earth, but also the most panic prone. They just decided, oh, we're never going to do any nuclear power again. And they're still not thinking straight, but at least they're beginning to go back to it, or at least they were. Barack Obama was talking about it until the Fukushima came along. The Germans were thinking similarly, very logical thinkers, they were going to extend the lifetime of their existing reactors. But then Angela Merkel, she gets hung up in Baden-Württemberg and doesn't get the vote. And she goes, ah, even though she's a physicist, we should take her card away. <laughs> <laughs> they teach us to be tougher than that. Um, the French, of course, are going their own way. The French always go their own way. And in this case, I have to admire them because they're doing it exactly right. They've invested in the technology. They have the uranium stored. They have the, uh, they have the facilities built. When the rest of us are in the dark, French will be living the, the beautiful life. You know? <laughs> and of course, they will sell us some if they like us, and we reduce our corporation taxes or whatever they want us to do. They give us some power. But, God, why can't we do what they're doing, or at least a tiny percentage of what they do? Why can't we have just one nuclear reactor, for God's sake? They wouldn't bankrupt us. <laughs> of course, we, we have no problem in buying nuclear power from anybody else. We just don't want to have anything to do with it ourselves. Anyway, I've said enough. I've probably said more than enough. Um, as you can tell, it's a complex issue. Um, there is no nuclear power or no nuclear physics or nuclear engineering program in this country. And there won't be until the government lifts this ridiculous legal restriction on having nuclear power. I mean, if you, if you compare what happened, if you look back in the 40s and 50s, when there was rural electrification and the building of Ireland Prussia, and the government turned around to the university and said, we want all these people trained for the ESP, we want you to start electrical engineering departments, go for it, and they went for it, and this is why we are where we are today. They need to do something similar. They need to turn around and say, look, in 20 years' time, this is going to be a very different world. We won't have energy, we won't be able to do this, we won't be able to do that. We need your help. And whether they choose nuclear or not, I don't care. They should have a debate where they put all the things up against each other and then try and be reasonably logical and scientific about it. And if nuclear loses, well, so what? I mean, you know, there'd be something else there.
but they're not even having the discussion. They're, they're sort of... And I, I understand why people are concerned with the immediate economic problems, but you know, we'll get through them. This is economics. Economics is flexible, it's malleable. It's hard, but you can get through it. You can't beat the laws of physics. No amount of pleading or IMF bailouts or any, you know, political shenanigans are going to change the laws of physics. You're there and God help you, you know, there's nothing we can do. Okay, anyway, look, thanks for the invitation and let's have some questions and some discussion.